You just want to kill the projector? Uh, go back, go back one. Go back one. You hit it twice. Okay. So guys, today's going to be fantastic because, for once, we have the power. <laughs> Our first guest is Mr. Alan Oppenheimer, a.k.a. the voice of Skeletor, Merman, Man at Arms, and Master of the Universe, among many, many others. <laughs> Next is the voice of she herself, Melindy Britt, and for your video game folks, both of them have voice parts in the new and awesome Fallout 4. Woo! And next up is a man that basically, especially if you're my age, drew our childhood. If you're anywhere near and have watched the animated cartoons such as He-Man, Masters of the Universe, She-Ra, Princess of Power, Ghostbusters, Smurfs, and even the Flintstones, he is animator and creator Tom Cook. <laughs> so, how are you guys doing today? Enjoying, enjoying the time at Phoenix Comic Con? Yep. Mm -hmm. Yes. 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 Fantastic. I'm excited about this. So, both He-Man and She-Ra were groundbreaking in several ways back in the day. He-Man could actually hit other characters, whereas She-Ra was not allowed to hit human characters. She could only hit, like, mechanical or robotic characters. What, do you have any thoughts on that? Or, I mean, I don't understand how that would never play today in the world of feminism, and it shouldn't. Equal. Someone, oh, someone was saying to me about... Um, or I heard that when He-Man was first brought out, he was more like uh, uh, the, de the, the defender in that sense. And whereas She-Ra, even being feminine, was kind of an aggressor in that sense. I mean, she was she could fight, but she always fought in, in more feminine ways. She fought with her mind a lot of times. And I thought that was really cool. Tom, any thoughts? Well, for me, I just drew whatever the director told me to draw. <laughs> so we'd have a, the director of the show would put little thumbnails in the side and say, you know, right here we have to have so and so. So I had to follow the script. But uh, the cool part of my job was they gave us, it was an interesting thing called a cassette tape. <laughs> and it had all the voice tracks so we could listen to how they were saying whatever they were saying so we knew what to animate. Because obviously, if, if somebody said, look out, and all you did was read, look out, we wouldn't know what to draw. But if it was, look out, then we knew we had to do something real dramatic. So and it was because of the great voice artists that we had that we could do really good animation for the show. <coughs> What's the question? <laughs> well, I can switch to another one. Cause I, I'm actually very curious about this. Um, he man had a run of about 130 episodes. She-Ra, I think, had 93. Um, and this is quite some time ago, but yet it's still being watched, I think, um, at any point, at any time, somewhere in the world, one of those cartoons is being watched. And I'm not being paid for it. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. That's true. Um, I, um, those cartoons are being watched somewhere, many places across the world. For years. As, as is... Uh, uh, I love Lucy. It's always on somewhere. And uh, it's timeless. Um, the characters are timeless, the stories are, the message is. And uh, it's quite a legacy. I, mean, I, I know that Melendi will second this. And we did it, got paid and went home, and never thought much about it after that. Here it is 30 years later and still popular. I knew it was a, I knew it was a special series. Um, because back then, when you when we would do an audition, or at least when I would do an audition, we did an audition and then we uh, got the job. And then, as Alan says, we just went home and that was it. With this one, I had to uh, audition, and then I went in to see Lou Scheimer, the producer. And I had worked for Lou once before on a, uh, uh, a uh, I think it was a filmation film thing called, uh, a special called Snow White Christmas, and I played a wicked queen in it. And uh, for this one, 
did the Shiva audition, came in to see him, and talked to him about the character. So I thought, well, this is more involved than any other thing that I'd ever done. And then I, I actually even, I think, came back another time and we talked about the character. And then I got the role, and then when I came in to, the, uh, to find out who else was in it, we all came around and we did it like a radio play. And the talent in there, at least to me, I mean, it's fabulous. Alan and George Vicente, John uh, Irwin, just, just really, really talented actors. And so it was special to me for that reason, and that we did so many of them. But then after that, after it was over, it was like, okay, it's gone, you know, the series is gone, we go on to another. And then to have it come back, so many years later, and to finally meet some of you and, and find out how much it's meant to all of you is, as Alan said, it's just it's tremendous. Well, of course, the important thing about Shira was it was really the first show that had a woman as the star. I mean, Wonder Woman was in Super Friends, but <laughs> there were other men in there too. But really, this was the first adventure show that had a woman as the lead character. And I know just from fans coming up to me that. Uh, the young women, this was really affected their lives, that they had this character they could look up to that wasn't like the second fiddle in the show. She was the star of the show. That was really yeah. important for a lot of people. Yeah. Any, any questions from the audience so far? Yeah. I'm curious on the voice acting side. Do you, did you voice one episode at a time, or did you voice like a lot of time? How long does it usually take to, to voice, to do the voice for the well, We would do one episode at a time, and we would do a, a quick, fairly quick read through. Maybe there'd be a few minor line changes and adjustments. And then we would record it. And it was recorded like a radio show. And I don't, I don't think the actual recording took more than a half an hour. Uh, well, I, what were they, 15-minute episodes? No, they were half hour. Well, then it took a long time. <laughs> it just seemed like 30, 31 minutes, maybe, <laughs> allowing for commercial. Because right. honestly, when we were sitting around in the group beforehand and reading through the script, these guys, I mean, they were just, they, they would say the funniest things, and so it's a good thing we sat around, because if we did that in a studio, we'd all be laughing too much. I mean, some of the lines were so funny, and, and he was one of the worst. He was just always making laugh. I'm notably obscene. <laughs> <laughs> and plus, you have to think that it took them 30 minutes to record the episode. Well, how long do you think it took us to draw the episode? <laughs> it did. How long did it take? Well, we, it took us about a week and a half per episode because we had 65 episodes to do in 52 weeks. So we had anybody that worked in the business back then, all of the work at Hanna-Barbera, Ruby Spears, and all the other studios that I had worked at in the past, they sent all the work to Korea and Japan. But Lou Scheimer had said he would never send work overseas. So that was the only place to work in the United States all of a sudden. So, you know, we got another 10 years worth of animation work out of that because of Lou Scheimer. So, uh, you know, Walt Disney was important to American animation, but Lou Scheimer's right there. And he really kept yeah. us working. And uh, it was, we were so grateful to him that when the studio finally ended up having to close, and he announced that it had to close. We gave him a standing ovation because we knew he had really worked to keep us keep us working. And as well, he, he brought in when he had worked with you before. He he was brought in for other series uh, that he did as well, which was it, it was really great working back then because it was the community of voiceover and, and voiceover acting and, and 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 on camera as well. It was more like. Uh, a family. It was like a, 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 a group of people who were a, a repertory company in that sense. It was great. It was really fun. It was like the old studio system mm -hmm. in motion pictures, the same people. <coughs> they were movie after movie after movie at the same lot. And we would do the same thing in, uh, in cartoons. Um, rarely, once you established yourself in a cartoon, did you have to audition for another one. You just trusted that you would come up with an interesting voice for that other series. Do you have another question 
Yeah, right here. Actually, a question for Mr. Cook. Um, so, one of the things, looking back on, on the show of He Man and She Ra Bull, uh, that really stands out in a lot of the other shows is that the, the background and, and the world that it took place in had this very kind of unique mix of like high sorcery, high technology, and, and sort of sword and sorcery clan style mm -hmm. imagery. So, what, what were some of the artistic influences <laughs> that, that kind of brought about that conglomerate, that unique combination? Well, I mean, for us, uh, being the animator, I really didn't have anything to do with the design of the show or the backgrounds, but uh, I have a panel tomorrow at 1.30, plug, 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 um, <laughs> all about Saturday morning cartoons, and I go into how we made a cartoon step by step, and there's a section about the backgrounds, and, and I mentioned that this is one of the nicest things in formation, is they have these really unique looking science fiction backgrounds that are so well painted. Uh, then, I mean, it's a piece of art, you know, all in itself. And it was very inspirational as an animator to have all that as the background to be able to draw around that. And especially when you were in Skeletor's area where everything was built of bones. And uh, although it was a pain in the neck to draw <laughs> that many bones, it still made the character so unique. And Hordak, who was the villain in, in Shira, had even more bones around him. But, uh, but Skeletor, for me, was one of the, the, my favorite characters to draw in the show just because it was such a, uh, a cool character. The one thing I hated to draw was she -Ra because you have to draw her pretty. <laughs> and if you don't draw her pretty, you don't do it. So it took too long to draw her. But it you, was, did a, you, did, you did a remarkable job. Well, you know, to tell you the truth, what we did is that there were three assistant animators that were very good at drawing pretty women. So we would just leave the face and not do a face. And they would put in the face so that it looked very good throughout the show. Because each animator, I mean, some people were really good at drawing women's faces, some people weren't. And you didn't want, you know, the walking dead she <laughs> coming at you. But, uh, <laughs> maybe today. <laughs> But, uh, so that was the thing about Shira, is she was just so, you know, such a wonderful body and everything, you really had to catch that. With Skeletor and He-Man, it was just muscles, and if you made the muscles too big, who cares? But, you know, with her, you had to be really good at, at making her feminine yet strong looking. Yeah? Just kudos for being able to animate her doing those high kicks while gracefully maintaining modesty. <laughs> <laughs> yes. yes. The angles of the skirt you had to be careful with. Very well done. Yes. <laughs> did we have censorship, censorship then? Well, they did. Yeah. Uh, they were Probably. really aware of not hitting anybody. If you ever noticed Skeletor and He-Man, they never had a big sword fighting scene. And I would have loved to have done a sword fighting scene, but at, back at that time, they had really had this one woman who was trying to eliminate cartoons altogether. And she made it so we had to be very careful. And whenever you saw He-Man, he would shoot his sword off, the effects would go out, and then you'd hear a big crash, and then they'd cut everything just smoking. But you never saw it just explode, because they didn't want to have all that violence in the show. Mm -hmm. And having grown up with Looney Tunes and watching Bugs Bunny torment everybody, and, you know, I never for once thought I could hit my sister with a frying pan, and her face would turn into a frying pan, and then pop back. But for some reason in the 80s, they were afraid everybody was going to, you know, kill their sister. Well, I, 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 like, I like the fact that they did that, however, though. Yeah. Because now, uh, parents aren't afraid to let their children watch it. And it's one of the things I hear a lot. Is and one of the things which doesn't have that yeah. much. Uh, and every story had a moral. Right. And at the end of the show, if you didn't catch it, He-Man was going to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> Today's show was about Orko. <laughs> And it would always have a moral to, to the story. And uh, that was one thing that Lou really loved about it, is to give something that the parents could point to and say, you know, this isn't just another cartoon. It's actually got a story and a point to it. Yeah. Can we hear some characters, please? I'm <laughs> <laughs> hmm. Tom Cook. I'm going to have to <laughs> Maybe a, a little verbal Donnybrook where She-Ra foils Skeletor that ends in Skeletor's trademark. <laughs>
<laughs> Feel free to decline. Put on the spot. I work with voice actors a lot, so <laughs> I need a script. <laughs> oh, wait a minute. Here's one. Doesn't anybody around here know how to treat a lady? <laughs> yes. I do. Now sit down and keep quiet. <laughs> That was one of my favorite lines that she had to say. I just loved that. <laughs> so, Mr. Oppenheimer, I'll have a follow-up question for you, Ms. Britt. But okay. what do you think it is about Skeletor that, I mean, if you talk about Masters of the Universe, even me, Skeletor's the cool one. And I'll bet Mr. Cook, when he does his sketches, I, I, it, Skeletor's got to be four, four or five to one yeah. over He-Man. And a lot of that, I think, has to do with the unique forces. I mean, just me personally, it was something about Skeletor you connected with. <laughs> <laughs> <Really? laughs> well, Matt, you're a lot sicker than I think. <laughs> Those that know me. Uh... <laughs> well, I think, you know, the Skeletor is fun because he's a, he's a comedic villain. And uh, I think when we first started, if I'm not mistaken, he, he didn't have as much comedy in, his, uh, in the original writing. There might have been one insult of you boob or you fool or whatever. Well, I just took that brand with it, and most of those insults were never printed, as you can imagine. But I, and I've said this before, and I, I always look, I don't care how dramatic a piece is, whether it's a theater or movies or television, somewhere in that there is a comedic moment. And I've seen it in, in horrible things, and in newsreels, the same thing, the person the way they treat a terrible moment in their lives, and they they gloss over it if they can. It's the only way to survive. Well, I find that I inserted as much comedy as I could into Skeletor, and that made him unique in terms of, of villains. The laugh came, um, I don't know how. I really don't. It just... <laughs> I, I put him up here because of the bony face and made it nasal. And then I, I guess I just... <laughs> and then all of a sudden it developed into... <laughs> and I've had, I've told this anecdote before. I, we were touring in South America, my wife and I, and we had two different drivers in two different cities. And when I did the voice, they almost crashed the car. <laughs> so it's an international laugh. <laughs> and for you, Miss Britt, back when She-Ra was on, not only was she the first character I think that a lot of young girls could really look up to, the regality and the way she conducted herself, um, but I also do a lot of work for LGBT rights, and She-Ra is huge in the LGBT community. I mean, my friends, when they found out that I was going to have a chance to work with you, they were like, out of all the other people I've worked with, and I've worked with a lot, like, you're working with She-Ra, oh my gosh. And it's something about that character that resonates with that. I've ha I found that out myself, and I have some fun stories and some very poignant stories uh, of people who've come up to me at some of the cons and have talked to me. Um, I don't know why she resonates so much except the fact that she incorporates both what is considered stereotypically male and female. In other words, she's a whole being. She was, she was, we just mentioned that she, she was very strong, confident, and uh, had wit, and yet she had a nurturing quality. And she, to me, she almost transcended gender in, in that sense. She, and I, maybe that's because she was a superhero. Maybe she was beyond real. And maybe that's what a real superhero is. I don't know. Uh, but, as I said, I've had some, some beautiful stories. And interestingly enough, too, I thought because it was a cartoon series that it would only appeal to children. I had a, a nuclear physicist who at lunchtime would watch it. And I thought, what? I don't really know what it was about that particular character that appealed to so many groups of people. Whatever it was, of course, I feel absolutely blessed to have been a part of it because it makes, to me, one of the things she was fighting for, she wrote, 
was to bring the world together and fight evil. And tolerance, of course, is one thing that I think we're beginning to see is evil. And um, if, we, if she could have brought the world together, then that would have been great. But um, anyway, it, it, I think that was one of the things she was fighting for in her uh, great rebellion. I have a question on the animating side. You said that you would work off of the cassette tapes. Yeah. Now, their voices and personalities for the characters were so over the top sometimes. Did you ever get a cassette tape where you're like, oh no, how do I draw this? No, not really, because if something was really way too over the top, I'm sure whoever was directing the voices would have said, no, that's too over the top. Let's bring it down to here. So, for the most part, by the time you got the cassette, it was, you know, it was pretty well done, and nothing that would have been kind of out of the ordinary. And uh, so, but I mean, that and the storyboard were the two things that we had. We had the storyboard, which is like almost like a comic book uh, for each scene, and then the voice track. So that's how we kept things so that it would move along. And it was to the point where you had, uh, everything was in footage back in the day. So you had nine feet and eight frames to be able to get this done. And so you couldn't go nine feet and 10 frames because it would, it would move into the next scene. So it was all pretty regimented by the time it got to us. And uh, usually each show was a little bit over and then the director would cut out certain things to make it fit so that it would have the right uh, timing for the commercials and then for the end credits. But uh, yeah, nothing was really too over the top for us. It was more of a live action show than it was a real crazy cartoon. I could see with like Animaniacs or something where you might get something that's over the top. But how over the top could you get with He-Man, you know? <laughs> yeah, right here. Another question on the animation side. Um, did you have any idea as far as the values of the, of the cells and stuff like that when you were doing it? And did you ever keep them or did the... No, I have, I have a few cells that I kept, but for the main... He used to turn the work in, and it was all done in pencil on paper. Then they would Xerox it onto a cell. So all that was done after it got to me. So I never got to keep any of the cells. And it's just been through years of, you know, seeing things online or whatever, picking up a few here and there that have got some cells. Interestingly, with all the cells that are out there, people always bring them for me to sign. And I was telling them, I said, well, I didn't do this, but you know, I'll be glad to sign it since I worked on the show. Well, two shows ago, somebody came up and my jaw hit the, hit the table because it was one of my drawings. And I was sure hoping he'd give it to me. <laughs> <laughs> but he didn't, but he was fine. I had to but you could see it with my handwriting and everything else. It's, it's rare because there were so many of us, about 40 animators that you know, did millions and millions of drawings. And by the time you try to find one of your own, you know, it's pretty tough. But uh, it was one of the questions we had in the show that we did in Calgary. Somebody said, were the characters designed after, like, Melendi, was she, Shira, was that who they designed it after? I said, obviously they could have, you know, beautiful blonde, right? And it obviously he met. It. Oh, yeah. Right, right here. Right and if you tear off Alan's face, it looks just like <laughs> <laughs> so at what point when the shows were on they were obviously a big deal then but what point did you kind of realize that you know i'm a part of something special i mean this is this is kind of a big deal i mean here's my action figure and here's kids i.e not a kid but there's a kid with a t-shirt on with me on it or the character i play well i didn't realize that until three or four years ago when i started doing these things same here. I had for no me, idea. For me, it was a situation where I inevitably go out to dinner with some friends or something, and somebody says, what do you do for a living? And I'd say I was an animator, and they'd go, what is an animator? <laughs> and then I'd say, like, well, I work on shows like Thunder the Barbarian or some of these other shows, and they didn't really know. But whenever I said I worked on He-Man, all of a sudden everybody said, oh, my gosh, my kids love that show. <laughs> so that's when I kind of realized that He-Man was, you know, way up here and all the other cartoons were down here. And with 13 episodes per season for most shows, 
He Man was the first show that was syndicated, so it was on Monday through Friday instead of just Saturday morning. So we had to do 130 episodes in two years. That's 10 years worth of another show. So we did 10 years worth of animation in two years. So, but it was just so huge with the toys and everything else that uh, that's when I knew we were really working on something big. Hmm. Anybody else? I want to make sure I leave anybody out because I can sit up here for a while. Um, <laughs> so, have you guys had a chance to, you know, after the show, have you like had a chance to sit down and share this with like your own kids and families, and you know, what what do they think of it uh, afterwards? They don't care, mine. <laughs> <laughs> they really don't. They've got their own lives. If some friend of theirs says to them, oh, your dad did this, yeah, yeah, that's right, he did that. No. But they don't really care. <laughs> My kids at the time, uh, they didn't really care. Um, uh, uh, but now my grandkids think it's kind of cool. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so that, that's about it. But when my, when, when my kids were little when uh, I was doing it, they didn't really care that much. You know, it wasn't that big a deal. Just mom's work. Okay. I didn't get married till I was 38, and most of my animation days have been behind me. And I'm still directing things like King of the Hill and Duckman and some of these other shows. But that was just me sitting in the kitchen, just writing down what I wanted the animator to do. So there's no connection that I was actually involved in a TV show. But my wife came with me to one of the shows, and she was sitting there when somebody came up to me and said, Mr. Cook, you're a legend. <laughs> that was the biggest mistake, because she laughed so hard. <laughs> 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 and, I, and I just told the person, I said, look, I really appreciate it, but look, Stan Lee was a legend. You know, Bill Hanna, Joe Barbero legends. I was just an animator. So I certainly wasn't a legend, but it, it sure made for good conversation. <laughs> there were a couple of times when I was doing the She-Ra series, though, that, that I thought, oh, this is fun, this is cute. Because my I used to go to New York twice a year to do some work, and uh, I stayed with a good friend of mine, and she had two boys. One was about three, and the other one was about, I guess, about eight years old. And the first time, oh, oh, she, she told her younger son, who always walked around with a sword, you know, He-Man sword, the three-year-old. She said, she was coming to visit. And he went, what? <laughs> and so when I walked in, he was standing there with his sword, you know, <laughs> and he looked at me, and then he ran over to his mom, and he whispered something, and I said, what are you saying? She said, he said, that's not Shiwa, Mom. Shiwa's hair is yellow. <laughs> <laughs> and where's the costume? Yeah, exactly. And then for her son's birthday, the, the older one, the eight-year-old, we, we went to a son's skating rink, and uh, and uh, as as, it, as like you know when they're giving the presents and stuff, she had me come in and do the uh, for the honor of Grace Skull. You know, I am Shiwa, and the kids were like. <laughs> so that was cute, but as I said, you know, that was just all a part of being an actor. We never knew 30 years later we'd be here talking to you guys. Never thought that. Well, I, I worked in a room with two other uh, really good friends of mine that we met at Filmation, and now we're still friends, you know, 40 years later. But the three of us uh, were sitting there working one day, and I think it was on Shira, and uh, the one guy kind of rolls back from his desk and he says, come here guys. So we kind of rolled into the middle. And he said, we're going to be talking about the good old days at some point. And he said, this is the good old days. Oh, boy. So this wow. is what we're going to be talking about. And we kind of went, we never really thought of that before. Hmm. But that's true. And, and that's exactly what it's been. Because like Alan said, who knew, you know, 35, 40 years later, I was going to be in front of a bunch of people talking about those shows. And I find it, it impacted you guys so much, just like for me as a kid, I was impacted by the very early Hanna-Barbera cartoons, Yogi Bear, Huckleberry Hanna, and those, yeah. and Johnny Quest, which really made a big difference in my life and got me interested in animation. But, uh, so yeah, it's just, uh, it's just such a blessing for us to have been able to have been in that business and now to kind of relive it all is just, you never get tired of people coming up saying, I love your work. You know, that's what's the cool thing about fans, is because nobody comes up and complains.
So it's really, it's really awesome. You guys are super. And to know that, that we've all been a part of, of bringing some joy or some our happiness, our comfort, our uh, insight into your lives is really such a gift for us. I had a guy come up to me at one show in Seattle, and he lived in Chile. And he had said that his he's now lives in LA, in LA but he was uh, they didn't have any toys. They didn't have enough money to have toys, and they had this little black and white TV. And it was all you know fuzzy and everything. He couldn't really see it that good, but he watched He-Man every single day. And he said that kept him out of getting into bad groups of people because he wanted to be He-Man. So he didn't want to be the bad guy. He wanted to be a good guy, and it helped kind of get him through life in Chile until he could finally get to the United States and, and have real freedom. So, and it was just so touching that this has affected this guy's life so much that it's made him a much better person. And, you know, and he credits a stupid cartoon for doing this for him. So, I mean, this is really, you don't realize how much this touches people. You talked earlier about the morals at the end of the episode. And I've, I've said this before, and for those who have not heard it, I, I repeat it. Early on, I started doing this about two years ago, and in two different conventions, uh, four people came up to me who were in their 30s and were oh, five, six, or seven years old when we first started doing this. And they told me independently how the moral at the end of the story had saved them from committing suicide. At that young age, they came from such dysfunctional families and they were so desperate to get out of life. And there was some moral at the end of He-Man that gave them the courage to go on and they were there thanking me and Shimer and Filmation for saving their lives. I have a story as well like that one. The, one day, Lou called me and said, I'm sending you a letter that we received, and I think you'll find it very interesting. The letter read about, uh, told a woman had, uh, uh, was, had been watching the series with her daughter, her little daughter, and at, at the end of the show, one of the messages were, was about, uh, I'm paraphrasing, if someone has touched you inappropriately or done something with you that you feel is not right, tell someone. And the child told her mother about being molested. And she would not have uh, told her if that little moral at the end of the story, if she if she hadn't uh, told her to tell someone. It's these kinds of things that make you think, oh my god, I made a difference in someone's life. And. Um, there are, there are other stories like that, too. So many stories, so many. I had one girl uh, twice that came to the conventions. First time she came, she had a big uh, button on her uh, 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 shirt, and it had a picture of a boy on it. And I looked at it, and she said, yes, this is my brother. And uh, when he was in hospice, he used to watch Shira all the time. And he had a Shira doll that he held when he passed away. Well, I, I lost it, you know. These are things you don't know how much characters you do mean to people. And we, we just, gosh, we're so, so lucky to have been a part of that, you know? And I hope, I hope it meant, I hope it brought joy to you or something in your lives. I really do. I'm sure it did, or you wouldn't be here. <laughs> Anybody else want to make sure you get everybody in? Uh, yes, this is for uh, all three of you. If, if uh, you had one week vacation in either Eternia or Etheria in real life, how would you spend your time there? <laughs> <laughs> Next question. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. I'd watch reruns. <laughs> I'd go kiss all my animals. <laughs> no, I think and I'd, my friends. I think I'd get together with Orko and try to do some magic. Okay. <laughs> okay. And watch him fail. <laughs> okay. okay. Um, my question is for Melindy. I understand mm -hmm. you also take Catcher's voice. 
Oh, yes. Yeah, she was my favorite villain. I was wondering if we could hear a little cat. Well, let's see if I can. <laughs> what cat does it? Oh, Shira. <laughs> oh, my. Oh. Oh, Horyak. What is she doing over there? Get her. <laughs> You see why I love working with you? You got a martini conversation. It was like that every time we did a show. And right here. Uh, Mr. Pope talked about his exper or his inspirations in animation. I just wanted to know if you guys had inspirations in voice acting or um, people that taught you or gave you tips and, and tricks to, as you were learning how to do it? When I was um, a kid, for some reason, well, my dad, this is, this is way before your time, too. My dad bought me a little, like, I was a wallet sack tape recorder thingy. And you real could, to real tape. Yeah, real to real tape, a little one. And um, I would listen to commercials on television, and I remember the one that I used to practice all the time was for Suave. <laughs> 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 but I used to practice that all the time, and I loved doing the voice. And then I, I started really early doing voices. I had a, um, I, I had a kind of a, for whatever reason, I know why. It was because I used to yell at football games. I had a raspy kind of voice, and I, I at 16, I was the voice of a, a jazz radio station called "The Girl with a Velvet Voice," and uh, so I did that, and and. So I've just kind of done it all my life. And there were no real inspirations except for what I heard <clears> and saw. It just, you know, you hear things and it's something pushed a button and I went, okay, I can do that, I can do that, that's fun, I like that. that. For me, that's how it happened. Yeah, it was the same way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I grew up with radio and I found that I, I could uh, imitate the people that I heard. And uh, so, uh, I, uh, radio really is the thing that, like television does to some young people today. That's the thing that gave me the inspiration. That this is what I wanted to do. Um, uh, I remember when I was in college, there was a there was a show that was, I went to school in Pittsburgh, and there was a show on KDKA called uh, Adventures in Research, and uh, it was a science show we did once a week. Am I getting too close to the mic? Yeah, it's not okay. good now. Um, and invariably, I would play a different nationality scientist. Now, one week it was a, a South African. Now, I had no idea what a South African accent sounded like, but I knew, of course, that the British had populated, and also the Dutch, the Boers, B-O-E-R, the Boers. So in my imagination, I put together what I thought was a Dutch accent, an English accent, and came up with this. Well, years later, I'm listening to a broadcast from the UN, and the ambassador from South Africa was copying me. <laughs> <laughs> so a lot of it is, is imagination, and if you can... Also visualization, I've said this before, if you visualize what the character looks like and what he's doing, it really helps give you an idea of how to do the voice. For motion pictures, it was like Laurence Olivier. He had to put on a nose to get the character. He would put on a false nose or false lips, and suddenly, after all of that rehearsal, it would come together for him in that way. So I did the same thing in voice, that's all. And I have one back here. You put your Shira shoes on, bow or sea hot? Neither <laughs> one. <laughs> no, actually, I think that she actually likes Seahawk the best, but I, I don't think she was ever meant to have a personal relationship. I don't think she ever was. She was, uh, she, there were so many things that she kind of transcended in that way. But she loved everybody. She did love everybody and everything. Um, 
But no, but I, Bo was just fun. He was fun and everything. He's darling, but no. <laughs> Seahawk was kind of cool, but they, it was, it would, no, it, there was just, there was a, it wasn't meant to be for her at all. I don't think. No, I cannot see Shira getting married and having kids, no. I just can't see that. <laughs> Yeah, back here. Many of the voice actors that we get that come to these panels talk about how they go to work, they get in their little cube, and they do their voice acting. But as you all have said that you filmed your show more like a radio broadcast. I've never heard an experience or anyone talk about that experience. Can you kind of share some of those experiences about actually what it was like to be all in the same room and to actually do that kind of a, a broadcast for that kind of a... Uh, it's interaction. Story? It's it's really acting. It's interaction. If you're all in the same room, you can play all of each other. It's not like you're not doing a monologue. So it's the same thing, but without your body, without pauses, you can't take the kind of pauses you put in film, where the camera fills in what your thought is, those thoughts have to be filled in with your sound or your the way you stretch a word or the interaction. So when I say radio, when we say radio, we are talking about really talking to each other. It's pretty hard to work alone. It really, it doesn't, it, it's not good. And when you had a cast, as we did, uh, you know, just like in a room like this, there's energy. Yes. And, and, and every person's, when every actor in that room got into their character, that energy was there. And, and that's what, I think that's what made that series work. It's those energies interacting and it made a whole, it's like a music, music, you know, you have an orchestra and everybody's playing their part and it's, it's not digital, it's analog. It's all full. It was really great. Yeah. Thank you. Have you ever had a line during your um, get together where you was so ridiculous that you just couldn't laugh? Uh, you just couldn't get through it? About how many? Oh, every, every, every time. <laughs> That's what I was saying. Is that you know we we would we would fortunately we had those uh, those uh, that hour. I think we had an hour to do the script, and then we had a break, and then we would go record. Gotcha. Yeah, and, and that's when we got all the laughs out. Because some of them were so bad, not so bad, but so ridiculous, <laughs> that, that we had to laugh at them. And then when we would actually do them, we could do them without cracking up. And then, of course, he'd have to, if someone would have to do a play on words with some of them, you know. <laughs> you, but, but that's what makes it fun. That's what gives it a likeness. That's what gives it a, a, a feeling of, of, of a, an ensemble and a realness, you know? I think. Yeah, let's go right here. Uh, oh, I was wondering, uh, I noticed on He-Man versus She-Ra that the line is different, where uh, He-Man says, by the power of Grayskull, and She-Ra says, for the honor of Grayskull. I was wondering if they ever give you a reason for that, that they changed the line for the She-Ra cartoon? They never gave me a reason. I, I've, uh, I've heard people talk about it, I've heard Lou talk about it, and I think they were talking uh, with, with He-Man. Uh, <clears throat> his was more of a protective, defensive sort of a, a character, and whereas uh, and he had the power, and then when She-Ra came in, her said honor, to me that meant bringing back the integrity of Grayskull, because they were both fighting for, for uh, the good kingdoms in that sense. And when Adora had been brought up by the Horde, and she, when she finally found out that, the, that uh, Hordak and, and the Horde, all of those were, they were really evil characters, I think she wanted to bring back the honor of, of, the, of the castle and all of that. That's what I think. Shira protected it. Shira brought back the honor because they were twins. Wow. Go ahead. And then um, my question is: uh, Did you uh, talk about you guys? You guys, I, I'm sorry, lost. Um, 
have you done any voice acting before when like it's already filmed and you have to match your voice for it? Yeah. I have. Yeah. Do, you, yeah. do you like do you like it that way better, or do you like it the way that you did it straight out without having the cartoon done? I've matched voices for people in, in, in uh, uh, cartoons who are not our films. Uh, who, it's very hard, very hard, particularly in animation, because a lot of times when you get called back to do a voice match, uh, something has happened with the animation that uh, whatever they said does not match the picture. So they, they're trying to match something so that they don't have to go in and spend a fortune to redo the animation and bring the star back in. So it's, I, I'd much rather do my own. <laughs> and the voices were done first, for the most part, in, in a cartoon, because we have to know what they're saying so that on a certain frame, we know what mouth shape to put on. And if you come to my panel tomorrow, plug, 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 I go through this and how we did that. I just did like for Japanese animation, yeah. you do it the opposite way. And so well, yeah, that, I don't I, understand. And if you ever watch Japanese animation, you'll see that the mouths don't ever follow what they say. I, I do. Yeah. So I, I, did, I, I did loop a Japanese uh, anime, and uh, the translator was very good and got as close, words as close to, that, they, uh, that they could so that to match the lips. And it turned out fairly successful. But to answer you more directly, Falcor in The NeverEnding Story was all drawn, animated, not drawn, it was, a, it was a big puppet. So they flew me over there to loop, to put the voice to him. Now, albeit he doesn't articulate like that, he articulates like that. And so I did it the first day, and, uh, and Wolfgang Peterson, the director, says, well, that's fine, okay. I said, well, let me see a playback. And I did, and I said, I have to do it again. He said, all right, well, we'll come back tomorrow. So the difference was that tomorrow I realized what was missing the first day, which was heart. And that's what I put into it the second day, and that's why Falcor touches you when you watch that movie. And I have a story about, about uh, Skeletor. I had a director that I had a scene, and Skeletor's talking away, and you have different mouth shapes. And a, a mouth is closed and B, C, and D is wide open, and then the e and, e and F is when they say, ooh, right? Well, at one point, Skeletor's saying, good. So the director calls me in and he says, what are you doing? This should be a six mouth, which is saying, ooh, and this isn't even close. And I said, uh, Mr. Director, sir, this is Skeletor. He doesn't have lips. Uh. <laughs> All he can do oh, is A, B, C, and Ds. And he kind of went, oh. You're right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right here. When you did your script reads, did you have the storyboard at that point so you saw what the character was supposed to be doing, or your, your script read was what generated everything else? Well, it depends, uh, both. When I did the, the Smurfs, we were able to look at the storyboard, but generally it was, it was just a script, a radio script. But if the, the director had, had the storyboard, and if there was a question, he said, no, come look at this now. This is, so we could refer to that. It was there if you needed it, or if you wanted it. I think with she though, we, we just had uh, uh, our scripts, didn't we? Yes. Yeah, we just had our scripts. Yeah. Uh, question for Tom. Uh, how many animators would work on, like I'd say, a weekly, half-hour cartoon? And how many man-hours would, would actually go in <laughs> well, we had probably about 40 or 50 animators, but we did the keyframing and we were in charge of what the action was going to be like. <coughs> but then we would put little charts on there on each drawing to show where the in-betweens go, and that was the assistant animator's job. So we drew everything in blue pencil, and then the assistant cleaned that up and put a really nice line on it, and then did all the in-betweens. And there were about 60 of those. Mm. So we had about 100 people working on each episode and we had nine directors and it was just go 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 we had uh, early on there was about a two-month period where you'd be laid off because the networks would have to figure out what new shows they were going to do and what shows they were going to renew so we had two months off every year and I kind of was when I first started I didn't like that I wanted to keep working because number one you're getting paid 
But uh, when, she, when he met Shira came along, since it was Monday through Friday, that eliminated that two week, that two month period. So all of a sudden we were just busy all the time. And people would complain about working so hard, but for me it was like, you know, thank goodness we're working hard because the, uh, the other side of the thing is you're not getting paid. So, uh, and I remember when we had a Christmas vacation we were gonna take while we were doing Brave Star. And they came around and said, we're gonna do a feature film of Brave Star. So if anybody wants to work on the feature, you're gonna have to do it during that Christmas layoff period. So most of us went, yeah, well, you know, because it was gonna be a little bit more fully animated. And that's what we were dying for, is to really make these things look really good. And the Brave Star film, if you haven't seen it, it's called The Legend of Brave Star. It's where you can tell everything's fully animated and it's really cool. You guys have had some very long careers, so I hope you don't mind me putting you on the spot. Yeah, even outside of Human and Jira, do you have a favorite gig, a favorite episode, a favorite storyline, something that you drew, for example, that really stands out? Like you, you know, you would put on your you would put on your headstone. Yeah, <laughs> there's probably there's probably two things that I was really really happy to be working on now, as well as all these shows I worked on, like Scooby Doo and all that stuff. That was all great. But I got a chance to work on Mickey Mouse in Prince and the Pop. And everybody that's an animator, you want to work on Mickey Mouse. But that was also right up there with Roger Rabbit. I got to work on Roger and, and, and Jessica Rabbit. <laughs> so I got to work on those characters. So, so that was really something that's uh, at the top of my list, what I worked on. Two things, I guess. Uh, First of all, She-Ra, because I have found out from meeting a lot of uh, you and, and at other Comic-Cons how much she meant to people's lives. And then the other one is a, <clears throat> an after-school special I did many years ago called Francesca Baby. And I played an alcoholic mother. And... Uh, Typecasting. Yeah, <laughs> and then I found out later. On, I found out later on that that particular, uh, actually, that show was going to be nominated. I uh, was going to be nominated for a daytime Emmy, but that particular year, the Academy split, so there were no awards that year. I oh. know, <laughs> but uh, I found out later on that it was being shown in a rehabs. So I thought, great. I mean, I, I loved doing the things that that changed people's lives, helped people's lives. So those are the two things that I really enjoyed. And, I, and I've done a lot of fun things, really fun things, and, and raucous, and, and funny, and, you know, 70s drama things. But those are the two that really meant the most to me. That's a difficult question um, for me, because I didn't... I did so much theater, and I did musicals, and I did television and pictures. I love doing the cartoons. I love the Smurfs. I love doing the stuff at Filmation. And there were certain series, like I love doing Murphy Brown and Get Smart, and things like that. And some of the movies that I liked were because of the people I worked with, like. Uh, the Hindenburg, and I got to work with George C. Scott, and uh, the Julie Andrews in my first movie star. So those things stand out for me, uh, but in the cartoon field, it certainly is what we've been talking about here today, yes. Yeah. So this is a question for, I guess, all of you. With the, uh, the proliferation of computers and technology of how it's made animation so much easier to produce, in fact, to the point where it's mainstream now, uh, what do you think of the future of that medium is to the culture of, uh, of expression as far as like, you know, uh, where it was once seen as just childish and only for kids, now it can be seen as an adult entertainment medium? Well, I was really fortunate that when I, the animation industry kind of ended and I moved up to Seattle, I got to work at Microsoft. And it's when they first came out with the 3D programs for computers. 
So I got to learn how to animate in a computer, which some of my friends didn't get a chance to do. And uh, for me, it's always, I, I mean, I hate to see that the hand-drawn artwork, you know, you no, no longer have to be an artist to be an animator, which is good for the non-artists, but it's not so good for the really good artists. I have some guys that work at Disney, some of the top animators, and they were older and couldn't figure out how to be, use a computer. So one of them, this last two years, he was a security guard at a museum. So it kind of hurt him, but it's opened it up for people that maybe could animate, but you know didn't really have the ability to draw. So it's like anything else to me. It's I don't <coughs> care what genre the, the movie or cartoon is done in, as long as it's written well and it's a good cartoon. Uh, you know, it doesn't matter if it's 2D because Tarzan and Beauty and the Beast were all 2D. And then you've got some 3D films that were really terrible. Um, so for me, it's more the story and, and the acting and, and, uh, and the animation, if it's good. So I don't know. I prefer the older style stuff because I have gray hair. <laughs> but I certainly enjoy the new stuff, too, if it's, if it's done well. Yeah, that's what I think. Too. I've seen some great um, uh, motion picture animation. Mm -hmm. uh, I've also walked out of some that was not so good. Mm -hmm. But there's some out there that I just, uh, I, I wonder at. I'm awestruck. It moves along. It's got great story. And uh, the voices are pretty good, too, even though I'm not doing <laughs> And I think some of, the, some of the motion pictures that are done today by computer animation are pretty damn good. Phenomenal. I feel the same way. I think as long as you have good story and and uh, good <laughs> actors, uh, there's some of the just as Alan and everybody says, some of it is magnificent. Some of it is really great. It's an evolution of the art. Yeah, exactly. <coughs> Do you have any advice for uh, if somebody who would want to start getting into the voice acting career? Like, where don't. Do start? No. <laughs> <laughs> go, go to law school. No. <laughs> now, I get that question a lot yeah. in my panel because people want to know. You know, I was a bus driver in Los Angeles, and through a series of incidents in three weeks, I suddenly was an animator. <laughs> uh, so that's what I tell people is, you know, become a bus driver. <laughs> but uh, it's, it's tough because if you're an animator, there's not much animation work done here in the U.S. anymore. You can still do storyboards or layout, but any of the production stuff is all done in the Philippines or even Vietnam. Um, so it's a rough, that's why I wasn't married until I was 38 because it's, it's a hard, you know, sometimes you're working like crazy and other times you're off and can't find work. So. Um, it's, it's pretty tough, but you really have to go where the animation is, and so that means moving to Los Angeles, or if there's another place that has, but LA is probably the place to be. And uh, so that's what I would do, is I go there and get any kind of job you can to get in the door, and then you can show your stuff to the studio heads when they'll listen to you because you're working there. And that's a way to kind of move up through the system. Were you, were you talking about voiceover? Yeah. Uh, 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 commercial voiceover or uh, spe specifically animation? Yeah. I think Alan would agree. Figure out the characters that you have in your head. I would put them down. Uh, I mean, in, in you know, basically what people do is, first of all, they get training, which is really always a good thing to do. Uh, if, if nothing else, you're going to get good feedback. Uh, but always remember to follow your own instincts. And then uh, most of the people, what they do is they'll, they'll put a, a, a demo uh, CD together and uh, try to market it to agencies. Uh, that's, that's about the, the only thing you can do, I think. Um, yeah, well, uh, when you're first starting, and I assume that's what you're talking about, if you have some way nowadays, you do, of recording yourself. I don't care whether it's on an iPhone or whatever. Pick out something, excuse me, pick out something you want to read that has meaning and record it and then play it back and listen to it. 
you'll learn by listening to yourself what you want to improve on. And do that many, many times, and you will sharpen and hone. And you'll be surprised if you compare the first take that you did with the tenth take you did, and how you learned during that time. And it's just practice, practice, practice. Do you have voices in your head that you... No. <laughs> <laughs> I mean that seriously. There's a special place for you. Yes, yes. <laughs> so, so the voice of the business. <laughs> And I got one more quick one, last one. Oh, okay. Uh, pressure. Uh, this is more prevalent in film, but what is your opinion on the abundance of using celebrities and film actors for voice work when it well, should I'm be professional <laughs> voice actors, I feel? It's one of my pet peeves. You know, I'd, I'd much rather see new faces and new voices rather than the same, you know, Brad Pitt as, who cares? <laughs> Not my thing. It's, it's about, it, it's, it's, ter it's, it's about money and how much the thing can generate as far as money. And I, 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 I don't like it only because I'd like to be doing the work. <laughs> I mean, I have to be really honest. Otherwise, it's quite fair because that's all fair in love and war, right? Yeah, I guess so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, they hire celebrities for marquee value. Right. Exactly. Not because they can do it any better than no, other not people at all. can, and very often they can. There are some uh, celebrities who have a unique quality to their voice. Or, um, oh, what is that wonderful actor? Oh, God. Well, who did Shrek? Uh, who did the donkey? Oh, wow. Huh? Who did the donkey? Brilliant. Yeah. Brilliant. is an unusual approach to the work, and that makes, he lives up to his marquee right, value, but a lot of people don't. So, if you wouldn't mind doing a treat for us, because I'm sure that's what most of us are here for, instead of hearing me close the panel, would, could I burden you to close the panel as She-Ra and then Skeletor, oh, 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 respectively? Oh, <laughs> a moral story. <laughs> a moral story. A moral story? No, no. <laughs> the only thing I can do, I think, is, uh, oh, let's see. For the honor of Grayskull! That's what's happening is people are seeing that going, oh man, that's going to cost me 80 bucks if I go up there. <laughs> no, just come out and talk to us. Hey, and, uh, I thought it was 200. Well, maybe, for, <laughs> maybe for you, but I'm only 80. <laughs> but uh, we appreciate you coming out here today. It was a really fun. And of course, to close the panel the way I would do it is, uh, let's go get lunch. <laughs>